Aloha and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Got Your Six podcast. This six-question podcast brings together high performers to share their methods, strategies, and ideas delivered in an informative and, most importantly, actionable way that will help you lead yourself and those around you from the battlefield to the boardroom. Coming to you every episode, I'm your host, Tony Nash. And into the breach. Nothing mentioned on this podcast is an endorsement or opinion of the Department of Defense. I got your six, we got your back. Got your six, we got your back. Got your six, we got your back. I got your six. Sixers, what an unbelievable treat we have. Um, there's many hats that our guest today wears. And when I was going through and doing my research, I couldn't just pick one. Well, I had to pick just one. So I narrowed it down to the father of Echelon, right? The military energy drink engineered, modified, tested by military uh, personnel. All the flavors are incredible, but we're here to talk to Eric Bartel. Eric, thank you so much for being on the Gotcha Six podcast today. Thank you for having me, Tony. Dude, absolutely. Um, Where to start, right? We were talking before we got on the adversity you've kind of you you've overcome throughout your life, um, being able to leverage you know having a career threatening or career ending injury in the military to then continue to come back to the community and benefit it. Where does that come from? Is it from being raised by your mom in Chicago, or is there somewhere else where you kind of continue to kind of tap into? and use that to propel you forward, regardless of what challenges lie in your path. I, I mean, to be honest with you, Tony, I've just always been kind of a stubborn bastard. And so uh, I've never really been good at taking no for an answer, or being told kind of where my place is. Um, and yeah, I mean, a little bit to the degree of you grow up poor and you kind of don't want to be poor again, um, or you have kids and you don't want your kids to ever experience that. So everything I do kind of dives into not only the security of growth and being um, irreplaceable almost, depending on whatever room you're in, to developing foundations to not only raise kids and raise, uh, I guess, uh, good additions to society, but make sure that they have everything that I did and, and they also understand why. As you look to continue to refine and grow your legacy, um, what would be something you would say from your time in the army that you constantly look to or lean on that you learned, that you learned along the way? I think for me, the army was all about leadership and really just developing it. It was, and, and there's, there's different leaders in the army. And if you've been in that, world, obviously, which many of your listeners have, that you, you very well understand who's a good leader and who's not. And for me, the differentiator between a good leader and a bad leader was always whether or not they're leading for the people above them or if they're leading for the people below them. Um, and I learned it very early in my career, but I always wanted to lead for, for the guys below me. Um, and so that is how I always kind of decided if I was doing a good job. Now, doesn't mean that sometimes those guys wouldn't hate me, but they'd hate me for the right reasons. It's because we were doing something hard that had to get done. But at the end of the day, they would go to the end of the earth because of it, because they knew it was the right thing to do. And so that was always kind of the fine balance. But for me, the Army was all about leadership, management skills and whatnot, and everything else technically that, that added was just a benefit. But I wouldn't be anywhere I am today if I hadn't developed that one skill set. The other crucial thing that you kind of went over is your your guys, your team, they knew they could depend on you. Knowing your personality and who you are and everybody that I've talked to about you says the same thing, right? The, the reliability that you bring to the table of constantly showing up who you are as you are uh, is extremely powerful. And they know that if there's a a sticky situation or a shitty moment that everybody's kind of doing, you're there rolling up your sleeves together. Um, where did that, did you learn that in the military from, you know, leaders or was it, was there somewhere else along the way that really is kind of like a light switch that went off? I think, I, I think you just kind of learn that 
dredging along the bottom of anything, right? It, people who don't understand that, I think, have never been that PV1 who had to do the shit detail, right? And so yeah. while it's easy to be like, hey, let those guys do that crap, and it's, you know, there's always the expression of, like, don't send your guys to do anything you wouldn't do. But, like, realistically, a lot of the times, it's just about actually doing it with them. And that's where you earn respect. And so while some you don't have to do it every time, but like weapons cleaning, for example, like I, I know plenty of leaders who pass off weapons cleaning to an RTO or something because they don't have the time to do it. And, and that's bullshit. Like maybe not every time you don't have the time to do it, but most of the time you should be down there with your guys because that's going to be one of the most opportune moments to really connect with guys is when they're smoking and joking and also to come down to their level and show them that you care and you're just right there next to them. And that goes from the military, but it also goes back to, like, organized sports. And I think organized sports are one of the biggest things that also helped build me to who I am in life. And I've played sports my whole life, and it was always an escape, which the military is for many people, too. But it was an escape from home life. But you learn a lot about structure and about who you are, and you also learn how to be a good leader and a bad leader to a degree in those two. And so if everyone's doing wind sprints and you're hiding in the back, like – you're kind of a shithead. Um, but if you're leading from the front and you're just pushing them to get it done, like that's why I look up to and I respect. And so I've always had that kind of mentality. And you were a freak youth athlete, uh, according to my research. <laughs> but I, I want to focus on something they talked about, right? The weapons cleaning and being down there with, with the team um, after an exercise or after an operation. And, and you're allowed to just kind of, it's very informal. People can then come to you and bring problems to you and you can learn a lot more about those that you lead. How do you implement that now in the civilian sector uh, of doing something like that with all the different brands that you're responsible for? I mean, it's, a, it's a, been scaled a lot more digitally, right? But it's as simple as like, if we have athletes, like one of the biggest things I think people enjoy our brands for, and we're by no means big brands, right? It's, it's the accessibility. And sometimes it's crippling. I'm not going to lie. Like my DMs are disgusting and, and my text messages are disgusting because there's a lot of accessibility, but it goes back to what you were talking about initially is like, if someone feels like they need to get a hold of me with something important, they text me or they, they shoot me a DM and nine times out of 10, like I can see that there's importance to this and I can, I can catch it before it gets shuffled down to the bottom. Um, and like, athletes wise, like people who are within our organization, whether or not they work for the brand or not, if they are, if they're out there on the, on the weekly pushing our brand, like nine times out of 10, we have a group and it's a group message and ideals are sprung back and forth. Everyone feels like they're a stakeholder in the success of this. And that's what I look at, like on the brand side, on the, on the building side of a business. Like if your people don't feel like they're a stakeholder, they just are looking for a paycheck, then you're doing something wrong. And that goes back to what you were talking about initially is people then roll up their sleeves to push and take the, they assume risk along the way, knowing what the overall purpose and end state is. Um, and having that accessibility, how do you manage that in a sense of, do you mark off specific time to like go through and kind of cleanse, or is it just as you're getting them, you're, you're going back and forth or is there something like a hybrid model? To be honest with you, poorly, it's, I do a poor job of it, but um, I think that's something I struggle with, to be very honest, and it's something I, I'm working towards. But between email, text, DM, like it's all completely saturated. And so it's a, I try and keep up with it. But if I'm on six Zoom calls in a row or if I'm doing something like this, it's a, when I get a chance to go back and dive in or it's really due diligence on the person who's reaching out to me side. And it's like, okay. If I've missed it because it got pushed to the bottom and I'm not going back down to find it, they reach out again. And, and that's just like knowing that it's not personal. It's just um, I missed it. And I can be very honest with people about that. Like, I'm sorry. Yeah. And the other piece I like about that is where you talked about, you know, everybody have, being a stakeholder is it allows for a constant refinement. So by the time you get to execution, there's been a lot of thought put into the actual operation or you know, mission that you guys are on where it's not like assumptions are made along the way and you're like, all right, we can make this work. And if there had been discussions, which there is, it, it allows for at least a better plan going forward. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and 
I think business and the military are very similar. Like I think, and I, and I can't verify, but I think a lot of business structures, business plans, they were all based on like military because there's so many parallels, but it's all the same in the fact that it, a plan is only good until bullets start flying. Right. And that's what we say in the military. And that's the same in business. You can plan yeah. all you want and it'll set you up for, it'll set you up for better anticipation of what's actually going to happen. But just like in the military and, and the business world, I've never had a plan to just be like, Oh yeah, that's exactly what happened. No, we just were able to war game it a little bit and be like, Oh, okay. We can anticipate this issue here and this issue here and this issue here. And then the 20 other ones that we didn't anticipate, at least, we cut out some and we were ready for those in to a degree. As you war plan personally, right? You kind of mentioned something like a challenge that you have with accessibility. Where are you challenging yourself now uh, as, as you continue to get deeper and deeper into, you know, refining brands, writing articles, being part of men's health, muscle and fitness, all these other th things that you do. I think the biggest, um, I don't even know if it's planning as much as it's execution side is, uh, and it's, I mean, there's books about it, but it's like prioritization, right? At the end of the day, there's the people of this learn how to say no mindset. There's the people of whatever other mindsets there are out there. And it's more so just like ever, all of us have the same amount of hours in a day. And it's how do I prioritize what I think will have the most return on investment. And from the brand side, that's really important, obviously, because we're building a business. But then I have all the extracurriculars, like you said. And so it's like, okay, well, is me continuing to do men's health a value add for us building this brand? Is me working with this other organization a value add for building this brand? And and a lot of what we do is is that. And personally, that's kind of a lot of what I take into it. So I turned down a lot of brands that, one, for me to work with a brand, like on the like influencer creator side, What's utterly important is that I actually care about that brand or use their products. And so like most of the time, if there's a brand just kind of cold reaching out, I'm like, I would never use this product. I'm never going to promote your brand. There's just, there's, it's not there. And I don't care about the money to that degree. Um, it's more about the authenticity. And so people respect that. At least I do. And when I see people out here pimping 20 different products every different week, I'm like, okay, I would never take your word on anything. Um, and that's so right. that's part of it too, but it's really just like, okay, only taking on so much. A lot of it is also building teams to help develop stuff. And so like on the fitness side, I have a, a team that helps me with the fitness stuff, whether it be programming, whether it be that other, other entities, whether it's this or that on the men's health side, obviously writers that help muscle and fitness writers that help. Um, and so it's not doing it all. Um, and that's, I mean, that's how anyone is able to wear multiple hats without just either burning out completely or, or just like doing a shit job. But like, for me, my primary hats are dad and, and husband. And so yeah. then it comes business, then it comes fitness, then it comes anything else that even fits in the mix. And sometimes those, there's just no more room for hats. And sometimes there is, it depends on what the other four hats are, are doing as far as bandwidth. And I, I love, and that was my next question. You already kind of led into it is you made sure you were, you're calculated when you align your values, you're intentional about your values and what is the the top priority and then how everything else kind of shakes out. And you're not, you're not concerned with delegating tasks out to other people as you build your teams, which I think is critical because a, a lot of what people do, especially high performers, they want to put all of this on their shoulders. What I think you're not what I think what you are doing is you're allowing for systems to continue to endure uh, as you continue to look at other opportunities and grow so that the organization isn't left flat if you were to like kind of pull out for whatever reason. Com completely. The idea is, and don't tell anyone, but the idea is to make myself almost replaceable at the execution level. And, and that's the goal I think people miss is like, people who are perfectionists or whatnot, they, they want to be in everything. And it's like, I don't want to do any of the execution. I only want to build strategy and develop plans. And then I want everyone else to execute. I, and if I'm doing that too, then it means I'm not, I'm not learning. I'm not building insights. I'm not building new strategies because I'm too far in the weeds executing. And don't get me wrong. I go to pretty much all of our events. I plan a lot of our events and help with the logistics of them. Um, 
but at the end of the day, that's never the goal. And so it's like, how can I bring someone on and not pad them so that they don't fail? I actually would rather have them fail a ton in the beginning because then it means they're going to learn faster and then they're going to understand that job hopefully better than I even do in the long run. Do you think as you build teams and you bring people on and you allow for failures to occur um, and, uh, and allowing yourself to kind of pull away, is that what has really allowed you to live this, this life intentionally? Or is there some other behavior or habit that you've instilled uh, that has really kind of improved your life? I think I've just done a really good job of surrounding myself with the right people, to be honest. I, I can't say that a lot of it doesn't have to do with luck to a degree of like being in the right place at the right time. And I think that's exactly it. It's like if you're constantly trying to show up and be in the right place at the right time, then then luck happens. Um, I don't think luck happens to, to people who don't put in the work for sure. But the it's crazy. The more work you put in, the luckier you get, like that saying. Um yeah. And I'm a big proprietor of that. And then the other part of it is just, I really do try and surround my people or myself with people who care as much as I do. Um, it's team oriented people. And I, I'm lucky enough to be on that side of organization where, you know, sales side is dog eat dog, right. But marketing and, and, and community in general, which our organization is unique and that we have a community department completely separate from marketing. Um, that's the last place it should be doggy dog. That's where it should really be like, how can we come together, can combine ideas and just come up with the most crazy plan that we could actually pull off. And that takes a lot of psychological trust within the organization. And that it's not just one person that brings that to the team. It's everybody having that shared understanding that you can bring these ideas together, bring them forward and then what allows us to innovate and test different things and see what works and what doesn't. But it's got to start somewhere. So I, I got to give you credit there for being and calculated as you pull, bring people onto this team. Um, but on the flip side, I kind of want to just go down this one real quick. As you test things out, right, there's failures along the way and you learn lessons. What failure has ultimately led to your greatest success? Oh, that's tough, right? <laughs> Um, I would say, honestly, probably tearing my meniscus and and it's not a, uh, I guess mental failure as much as a physical failure, but, um, right. Yeah. That really changed the path I was going. Had I not torn my meniscus right off the bat, I probably would have been just stupid gung-ho army the whole way through and would probably be in like regiment right now or something, just still, still, uh, hanging out in a green suit. But, um, that kind of changed my perspective on things. It, it put a chip on my shoulder. It changed kind of even my work ethic because I was up until that point, like just very, um, athletic, for, for lack of better terms, like just naturally. Um, and I did put like the way yeah. work, I did put on the track work. I, I was very dedicated to it. Um, but I relied on that really heavily. And so not having that and really going to 101st and going to the rock without a ranger tab and you had to really prove yourself in every other aspect of, of it without being able to just be a PT stud. How did you, cause that, that's a, like a, a fundamental identity shift. Um, what, what helped you along the way? Was it mentors and stuff that you sought out or was it just knowing, Hey, I got to show up a little bit more than everybody else and be a little bit more consistent. Or was there something I mean, else? there was definitely mentors along the way. Um, and it was, it wasn't like leadership mentors. It was like almost uh, peer mentors that helped out some I got there as obviously a second lieutenant. Some first lieutenants were like, okay, this dude isn't a shit bag. He's just in a shit situation. Um, and took me under yeah. their shoulder, like, here, do this, do this. And then honestly, a lot of times it was some of my NCOs, like when I deployed and as a PL and they were brutally just honest most of the time, but they would eat me up because I was the new guy, obviously. And 
they had to push their boundaries and figure out how far they could push them, but also like make sure that I was doing the right thing by, by the soldiers. And so some of the best lessons I learned, like I didn't learn it from a Tim Ferriss book. I learned it from those guys. I love, and this is something we show, right? You learn by doing it. It's great to read a lot of books. I know you have a ton. I got right. Like, but being out there in the trenches really shows your consistency when you show up every day. So with that, I kind of lead to my last question is Eric, how are you better today than yesterday? Well, I'm still learning, I guess, but I was learning yesterday. Um, what do you, what are you learning today? Oh God. Oh, everything business still. Like, I think that's, that's the thing that people don't really understand is the second you think you got it figured out is the second you're done. Right. Like, I am yeah. utterly just dumb in my mind. Like I don't know nearly enough and, and I'm trying to absorb from everyone. And so absorbing from you, absorbing from people on the call, absorbing from retailers I talk to, absorbing from people who are working for me, absorbing from people who are working next to me. Like there's always something to learn. There's, and I think it's, it comes along with, kind of a natural curiosity, but also like just a forced curiosity of like, if you don't ask the questions, if you're too afraid to ask questions, if you're too afraid to learn not only about someone else's perspective, but about maybe their knowledge set, like you're just hurting yourself. You're just missing out. And so a lot of the daily is refreshing on that and trying to learn from absolutely everyone, especially people who work in different skill sets than me, who work in the sales team, who work in the ops team, like figuring out how all of that works and ticks because it's only going to make me better. But then like also just then applying it. I think that's what people struggle with too, is like, it's great to learn, but like, can you formulate an application for it? And can you make that make what you're creating or what you're building or what you're, you're scaling better than, cause it's also great to have a lot of knowledge, but if it's useless, you just might do well on jeopardy. Eric, I absolutely love that. Uh, I speak on behalf of the Sixers, right? Not only are we excited to have learned from you the last you know, 20 minutes or so, but we're really excited to action what you talked about. Um, like we talked about at the beginning of the show, you are the father of Echelon. For those who can't afford a crash, military uh, energy drink for military, formulated by the military, where can people go to connect with you and learn more about you, know, you see the brands that you're working with? Yeah, so... Um which meant was go to gnc.com and type in echelon and uh, you can get some echelon delivered to your doorstep. Or if you got a GNC around you, we're in pretty much all of them. Um, and we're also available on all army and air force bases through AFES. So thank you. Um, also, you can come find me. I'm on Instagram mainly um, at real Eric Bartel, E R I K B A R T E L L. Um, I, I, dabble on TikTok, but it's mainly just to post a video here and there. I really don't consume anything having to do with TikTok. I'm trying to make sure they don't learn. Like the algorithm can't know what I find funny because I don't have time to waste on that app. And I, I see people just deep diving in. Um, and then I'm on LinkedIn as well, Eric Bartel. Awesome. We will make sure we link all of your social media as well as the link to GNC. I'm not going to ask you your favorite flavor uh, on the call because it's like asking your favorite kid. It really uh, does rotate the, by week. I think I, I drink one flavor like too much for a week and then I switch. And the funny thing is, I'll be very honest, I didn't like our white, watermelon Thai chili flavor that much um, in the beginning. Oh, really? And as of lately, it's been my favorite flavor. So it, the profiles really kind of switch up on you. So you can't miss with Astralon. Eric, thank you so much for your time, sharing your strategies, your methods. And of course, thanks for having our six. Tony, thank you for having Appreciate me on here. I don't know what you've been told, Sixers, but the lawyers would like us to remind you that the views, opinions, and comments expressed on the Got Your Six podcast are solely those of the hosts or guests to include current and previous Department of Defense employees and should in no way be considered the opinions of or endorsements on behalf of the Department of Defense or any of its components, divisions, contractors, or other current and previous staff members.